Little Marky Dragon, also known as Marcus Eikenberry in real life. And uh, let me tell you about my first real company. My first real company was uh, called Eikenberry Computer Services. We called it ECS for short. It was in Portland, Oregon. And uh, we opened up, uh, basically, I quit my government job. I had, uh, I had a good government job. I was driving for TriMet, which is the, um, the transit system in uh, the Portland metro area. And I, uh, you know, I, I had a good there. I mean, I, I was making 15 bucks an hour or so at the time. Uh, and granted, this is, uh, this is 20 years ago. Uh, you know, so that's that's good money, uh, and I was able to get overtime and stuff. Uh, I I was making a good living. I had great health insurance. I was in a union, and and uh, that was all fine and dandy. But really, I um, uh, still felt like. I was supposed to be doing something else. I'd been doing computers on the side for quite a bit and really just enjoyed what I was doing. I tried, uh, I tried actually to get a job, uh, actually working for other people, doing computers, but I couldn't get anybody to hire me because I didn't have the proper experience. And so I'm like, screw it. I'm going to make my experience. And that's what I set out to do. And so. I um, started fixing computers for people and, and everything, and that was working out really good. And I was making probably about 50 bucks an hour is what I was charging to work on people's computers. And you know, that seemed like a you know fair rate. Uh, uh, people were happy. Uh, people were coming to, to me for, for more stuff. And, and people were having me design and build computers for them. So I said, okay, I'm taking the leap here. And uh, because I had enough business on the side to support, um, you know, uh, to support myself. And uh, so I decided I was going to take a sabbatical. I took a six month leave of absence from my job. And uh, they weren't necessarily very happy about it, but um, you know, I just, I'm like, you know, I really want to do this. I want to see if I can do this and, and uh, you know, if I can't make it happen within six months, then, you know, uh, I go back to doing that. So it was a nice safety net. Well, I can tell you that at about two months in, I knew that I would never be going back to my uh, job driving a bus. And we just had got an explosion of business. We opened up this shop, uh, rented this place, uh, and it was, uh, um, you know, it was on a pretty busy street and everything. We figured out our advertising. Uh, we were in uh, Computer Bits magazine. Uh, we had uh, a full two-page spread in there. And we, um, you know, we're, we're doing quite the business. I can tell you, though, that uh, I didn't have a whole lot of real business experience. And so I was just really just kind of going out there and trying to make this work. And we were, we were getting very successful. I mean, uh, I remember that, you know, near the end, uh, we were doing uh, a quarter million dollars in sales a month. And, um, you know, that was, there was service, um, you know, we were billing, I don't know, Twenty, thirty thousand dollars a month in in service and everything, which doesn't have you know, which has hourly costs for for staff, but but doesn't have the same kind of costs. Um, you know, it's a lot higher profit than the than selling the products, and but I didn't know what I was doing. I actually needed somebody to be like a partner with me on this and be a business advisor to to help me keep the money under control. Um, what happened was is that we were growing so fast all the time that we couldn't keep up and so we'd have people come in and they'd put 50% down on a computer and we'd tell them that we'd have it built for them in five days or a week or something like that. I don't, I don't remember how long it was and that they'd pay the balance whenever, whenever they, um, they got uh, picked it up. And it was, uh, um, it, 
it was a very exciting time, but I didn't handle the money well. And when I say that, uh, there was a lot of money going in and out. Uh, we were building up inventory and everything. There was a lot of things we needed on hand. There was a lot of expenses. You know, there, there's of course the rent and there's there's some other stuff. And then, then there's the, you know, um, money for losses, for, for theft, you know, money for chargebacks, money for uh, payment acceptance, all of these things, money for advertising. And it, it we were growing so fast that what I really needed to do was I needed to cap it. I either needed to have an investor that had money or I needed to cap the growth. And because the growth was was going faster than what our, our profits were. And when that happens, you get upside down and so you start trying to, to grasp it. Okay, how can I stretch this to make this work? I did something which um, you can't really do these days. Uh, but uh, I did something which I didn't uh, I didn't know at the time that it was actually illegal uh, I do now and uh, what I was doing was as I was writing out checks for um, products that we were pulling in knowing that it would take about three days to hit the bank account and so we were writing these checks, getting all the product in, turning things over as fast as we could, getting the cash deposited in the account and and doing this whole cycle, well, that can get out of control. And the, um, the downfall of this was that, uh, well, it, it, one, of, one of our suppliers got nervous and, um, and they asked for some extra checks uh, to cover all the balance that they were going to cash, you know, one that day and another one in a week or whatever. Well, they went and cashed both of them instantly and uh, that caused my whole system to fail. So I know now that the term for that is kiting checks and that it's actually illegal. Uh, I didn't know that it was illegal. I, you know, didn't intend on anything bouncing and everyone did get their money. It's just that the money was in float. You know, it was, it was in process of transferring too. And every time we would take like a credit card, it'd take like seven days to hit our account and everything. And so that, um, that, that was a big lesson learned with that. Um, also, you know, I learned some other things, other things with this, which is, one is, is that customer, good customer service can go a hell of a long way. And that is, you know, to this day, one of my mantras. We did, um, we, we tried to do the best customer service possible, although I was very naive back then and I didn't know a lot of the things that, that were important to customers. Um, and, you know, I was just like, okay, well, we're just doing this and this and this, and I think that's what everybody wants. And, and really, I wasn't listening so much to the customer. Uh, you know, as you encounter each problem with the customer, you learn more, and then you adapt. And uh, so that's one of the main things that I learned in there is how important the customer is. Now, we also did a lot of stuff with like cost plus 10% and we did um, some other things that just caused these mad sales to happen. And it was all really great and stuff, but uh, I now believe that uh, doing sales or doing, uh, you know, subsidizing uh, prices or, or um, you know, trying to lowball things is not the best way to go and uh, because in order to have good customer service you need to have uh, the funding for that uh, it takes time to to actually you know deal with each person and deal with them properly to their satisfaction and if you're cutting margins really thin well then you have issues of not being able to keep up and, uh, you know, so if you're not making enough money and you, and you can't hire the proper staff and everything, then your customer service fails um, or you go in the hole. So uh, one, of the, one of the biggest things I learned. Uh, also, you know, I, I learned that you have to, um, you have to not be so arrogant. You have to not, um, uh, uh, you have to not 
piss off your suppliers and your competition, uh, we actually had uh, uh, got complaints to our um, wholesalers from our competition, and they were complaining that 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 we were. Um, exposing information that wasn't good for the industry, we were being too aggressive, our prices were too low, and um, and they were having a hard time competing with that because people would say, well, this store over here has it for less. Why don't I just go over there? And they'd say, well, you know, it's because we have better service or whatever. You know, and they were probably right. We, we couldn't afford the best customer service because we were, you know, cutting cutting prices. and. So uh, it upset our uh, vendors, our, our suppliers, which then came to us and said, you can't do that. And we're like, uh, there's nothing against the law on doing this. We're, we're doing it right. Well, we were arrogant with that. Um, well, what I didn't realize was that, that they were getting upset with us. And so then they were stopping giving us such good, good prices, um, which I didn't know that at the time. And then our competition, our competition was getting furious with us. And in fact, one of the guys uh, that owned another computer store, he actually called our store and left voicemail saying that he was gonna firebomb our store if we didn't, uh, if we didn't stop what we were doing. And um, I thought, holy cow, that's quite the reaction I didn't expect. And, uh, you know, looking back on it, he was very frustrated. Now, uh, it was also very illegal what he did. Uh, he did not firebomb us. Uh, in fact, uh, when I heard that, I called the police and I said, you know, hey, we've got this threat right here that that they say they're going to firebomb us, and if we if we don't change our ways and. And uh, so anyway, the police went out and talked to him and the next day uh, he called me in person and apologized and, and said that, you know, he was just frustrated and stuff and, and I get it. So, uh, you know, and uh, he, he asked me to not press charges because <laughs> apparently the police were ready to press charges against him. So anyway, that was my first uh, retail experience actually owning it and uh, it was very hard. Lots of long hours, which I've learned as part of being an entrepreneur, and lots of lots of work. So, and it was a big success in many ways. But I wish that I had had a business advisor back then that could really help me with the business end of it and help me make better decisions, because those decisions that I made eventually caused the downfall. And what I should have done is not try and keep up with the growth that we were having, I should have started turning customers away or we should have started raising prices because we couldn't, um, uh, we couldn't sustain at that and it, and it eventually caused the collapse of the company. Um, and, and that's kind of a philosophy that you can use is that if you have a limited resource of your time, let's say, let's say you're a one man show and you have limited resource of your time, well, you know, as people you know, come to you and ask for service, and you're at, you know, 50 bucks an hour or something like that. And instead of turning people away, why not take those other people on and have them at a new price? And so a higher price. So start charging them $60 an hour. And then what happens is if you're, as your existing customers, you know, drop off, uh, then you start making more per hour. And then if you're still got a lot of demand coming in, okay, so $60 wasn't enough to, to stop the herd coming in. Maybe you should go to 70, 75. And, you know, just keep raising it for new customers as they come in uh, based on your availability and um, until you stop the flow or, or ebb the flow to where, it's, to where it's, it's a manageable rate, you know, with your attrition of your other customers that drop off, and um, so then you'll eventually reach a maximum potential. And if you're really good, then you, um, you, know, you get a lot of repeat business and everything and you stay busy at a much higher rate. If you, um, if you start not having enough work because you've priced yourself too high, you lower it again. It's supply and demand, pure and simple. Uh, the supply you have is your time. So, uh, and that can work on a bigger scale with employees and everything or with a product or, or whatever. So, anyway, thanks for listening. I'm Marky Dragon. Take care.